talking about anxiety disorders and next we're going to move into the next major group which is the mood disorders. So mood disorders are also especially prevalent on university campuses. We know that up to possibly 20 or 30% of people might experience major depressive disorder, but only about 1% experience bipolar disorder. So these two different types of disorders come at very different prevalencies. So major depressive disorder is much more common, but these are both in the mood related disorders umbrella. And what really classifies them as mood disorders is you experience extreme emotional distress. It's not necessarily about stress or anxiety now. You might not even be stressed or anxious about anything, but your mood, it's hard for you to feel uh, acceptably interested in things because you might feel very sad or very, very, very impulsive and aroused. And so what can really happen here is you can feel absolute devastating sadness. We all feel sad sometimes, we all feel grief, we all have days where we just wanna stay in bed. But a mood-related disorder is when this is so devastating and so long-term, where you feel hopeless and negative, that it's really hard for you to function and it starts to interrupt your work, your school, or your relationships. Or on the flip side of it, you may also experience what's known as mania, which is really irrational and harmful impulsivity. And so this is the idea that you're not just happy, you, your brain is so hyperactive, you might do things that could harm yourself or harm your relationships or your job or your schoolwork. There's a lot of biological factors tied to mood-related disorders. We know they definitely tend to run in families. There definitely tends to be some sort of genetic component to both of these. And we know there's a lot of brain chemistry associated with both depression and bipolar. For instance, we know that major depressive disorder is definitely associated with low serotonin. We previously thought that perhaps bipolar disorder was associated with high serotonin, but it doesn't seem to be. It seems to be when you have low serotonin, but high norepinephrine. And so depression is when you have low serotonin and low norepinephrine. Serotonin has to do with arousal as well as norepinephrine has to do with arousal. So it's like your brain is more muted and more quiet and more sleepy. And mania tends to be when you have low serotonin but high norepinephrine. So it's hard for you to feel good even though you're really aroused. And so what your brain does uh, to, your, to you cognitively and effectively when, that neuro, when those neurotransmitters are at that level can really result in mania. We also know that sometimes these are not necessarily genetic. Uh, bipolar is almost always, but sometimes depression can be more about life situations. We know that sometimes a person who does, has no genetic risk for depression might experience depression in adolescence when they're experiencing lots of hormone fluctuations during postpartum or during postmenopausal years. And so when there is differences in our hormones that might also change differences in our neurotransmitters and may cause a depressive episode. So sometimes it can be situational. You can also experience it, of course, during grief or loss or other types of life events. So with major depressive disorder, what we really are talking about here, it's different than just feeling sad for a few days or after a breakup or after a death. That's pretty common and pretty typical and some would argue even adaptive. But major depressive disorder is when these persistent feelings of sadness occur even when life is going good. And it's the idea that you should be so happy, you should be so lucky to have your life, but you don't feel that way. In fact, it's hard for you to get out of bed. In fact, it's hard for you to really have enjoyment in almost anything. We often, we often consider depressive disorder to be sadness and crying, but some people who have depression don't cry on the surface. They don't look that way at all. What often they experience is just more of a flat affect where they don't feel necessarily sad, but they don't feel happy. They lose interest and they lose joy or pleasure in a lot of things they previously did. They might stop doing their extracurriculars or stop calling people or stop doing the stuff that they really used to enjoy and just kind of sit in bed. We know that because there's a strong biological aspect to this, we can see that the brains of someone experiencing a major depressive episode just doesn't light up as much as a person not experiencing a major depressive episode. And so what happens here is it's hard for you to experience pleasure. It's hard to really get your brain to engage because it's like your brain's on low battery mode and it's not lighting up like it used to. We tend to find people experience a lack of energy, a lack of motivation to do anything. And some people, they might not experience sadness, they might actually experience irritability or anger or broodingness and sulkiness. And that may be more the emotional experience they have associated with depression. We find men as compared to women are much more likely to become angry when they're depressed and may actually become more aggressive when they're depressed because they're struggling to understand this lack of brain light upness. We also find that there may be a lot of cognitive ruminations, just thinking about the bad stuff, hard to think about the good stuff. 
and when we see how the brain lights up it tends to light up just in one little circuit that really just keeps you on this little track of negativity and so being able to light up the rest of the brain can really help us to break free of that Depression tends to come with a five-fold sort of format. We tend to see it come and it really changes your behaviors where you're not doing the things you used to do. It really changes you physically in terms of the way you carry yourself, the way we can see your brain activity. It changes you cognitively in terms of the types of thoughts you have. You feel negative and hopeless about things that you otherwise wouldn't. It changes your motivation in which you stop trying to do the things you previously would have tried to do. And it changes your emotionality. Again, you might feel sad, you might feel anger, or you might just feel a lack of anything. And so we really see that five-foldness with depression. Now, what really happens here is because someone's going through this major depressive disorder, they might experience such hopelessness that the future seems bleak. They might really struggle to see it turn a corner. And we have to acknowledge that's a cognitive bias. That's a cognitive distortion. That's not reality. There is always a silver lining. And so hopelessness is an illusion. We know that life always has possibilities in front of it but depression can make it feel like it's not that way. And so depression can also play differently, whether it's more biologically based or more situationally based. If it's more biologically based or runs in a family, you might have a major depressive disorder that's gonna come in waves throughout your life. You may need to have some sort of long-term care treatment. For instance, if it's more situational, such as just one episode when you're in adolescence or one episode in postpartum depression, then it might be enough that if you just do a really important care over a year or a couple years around the event, that you'll be okay for the rest of your life. We know that once you get a second major depressive episode in your life, you're more likely to get more recurrent ones, but they can be years apart or even decades apart sometimes. And major depression is very different from bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is the idea that an individual flips between a major depressive episode and either a manic or a hypomanic episode. And so what is mania? I briefly defined it before. Well, if your brain doesn't light up during depression, what does it do during mania? It lights up so much. The circuits in your brain temporarily feel hyper-connected and you can make connections you previously never thought possible. Some people, when they're experiencing mania or hypermania, they use this as a moment of brilliance and artistic intuition, and they can create and compose lots of really cool art when they're experiencing mania and hypomania. And so a lot of artists that experience the hypomanic aversion, they actually find that helps them with their creativity. However, it can be very dangerous. Full mania, this brain lighting up, can also lead to a brain racing phenomenon where your mind is racing constantly. A lot of people who are experiencing mania have a hard time sleeping at night. In fact, they might spend three or four days where they're constantly awake, only taking short naps here and there. And they're constantly energetic, but irrationally so. They become irrationally optimistic, like everything's gonna be great, I'm gonna become famous, I'm gonna start this new company, I'm gonna quit my job and do this, I'm gonna invest all my money in this. And they can do things that can be really hazardous to their health, their relationships, and their finances. What can really happen in mania is somebody becomes uncontrollably impulsive. They might do things where they become very sexually promiscuous and might damage their romantic relationships. They might take a lot of substances. They might jump in front of traffic. They might go hitchhiking in the winter because they feel like they're invincible. They might drive a car and get into a car accident. And so what often happens is they could do things that could really damage themselves. And so in really, really severe cases of mania, a person might experience delusions and psychosis. Delusions could tend, delusions in mania tend to be delusions of grandeur. Delusions of grandeur mean you think you are gonna be really important and really famous. Like I'm gonna start this startup company and I'm gonna become the next billionaire. Or I'm going to ask this person out and we're gonna get married and I already have our kids' names, even though the person doesn't know you exist. Or, um, I'm gonna start uh, doing this and I'll quit my job and everything will be fine. And so these delusions of grandeur, feeling like you're better than you are, can really lead you down the wrong path. And after the manic episode, there could be things that are now damaging your life that you can never get back. And so we have to be really careful about what we're doing during a manic episode. We don't wanna uh, take a lot of substances, for instance, and hurt yourself. And so mania can be just as problematic as a major depressive episode, and it can be just as uh, detrimenting to our health and to our life. We know that there's a smaller version of mania called hypomania, where it doesn't get as severe. In hypomania, a person might become impulsive and might have delusions, but it might just be, I'm gonna completely reorganize my house in the middle of the night, 
or I'm going to stay up and read all this cool stuff on my computer and never sleep for two days. Or they might make something creative or they might go on a really long chat stream with somebody. They could still hurt the relationships and their finances, uh, but it's less likely to happen. They just tend to get really excited and really confident for a few days. Important to understand with bipolar disorder, we're talking about the manic, hypomanic and depressive episodes as lasting not hours, but at least days, if not weeks, where they stay in this mindset. Now there is another type of mood disorder we're not talking about for this course, but just briefly, it's the idea that somebody alternates between hypomania and mild depression, and it happens much more quickly. And what happens then is the hypomania is not really the problem. The really mild blues are a less problem, but the big problem is the rapid switching and the rapid switching between that can be very, very, very exhausting and very confusing to those around you. Now about bipolar disorder, it is extremely biologically based. We know that it runs in families, about 1% of the population has it. And we also know that individuals with a genetic risk for bipolar disorder, that they should try and avoid using cannabis. And that's because cannabis can really unlock and increase the severity of bipolar disorder. And so while cannabis is safe for most adults, the 1% of adults that have a genetic risk for bipolar disorder should avoid using cannabis and cannabis related products, as that could increase especially the chances of psychosis associated with bipolar disorder. 